Hello everyone, this is Kyle Caldwell. I'm the Executive Director of the Dorothy A. Johnson Center for Philanthropy here at Grand Valley State University in Michigan. I'm delighted to have all of you join us for how the tax overhaul could impact our sector webinar. We are hosting this conversation for the next hour to help you understand not only how the current tax overhaul proposals are uh, moving through Congress, but talk a little bit about some of the strategies and um, uh, some of the consequences of the policy recommendations. Um, just a few housekeeping items before I introduce our uh, illustrious panel. If you have questions that you would like to submit, we will have a question and answer period. We will be doing that via Twitter. We will not be opening the lines up for um, communication back and forth uh, by audio. If you do have questions, please submit them by Twitter to the at Johnson Center, um, hash, uh, at Johnson Center um, address. We will collect those and I will um, point your questions uh, to, to our presenters. We are uh, delighted that the Council of Michigan Foundations, the Michigan Nonprofit Association, and the National Council of Nonprofits have joined us on this webinar. They are both um, content providers, but they're also leaders in our sector, and we are delighted that they've agreed to be part of this important conversation. Um, today's uh, panelists um, are, uh, who are joining us from these various organizations include uh, Rob Collier, who's the President and CEO of the Council of Michigan Foundations. Rob comes to this work with a background working both in community, private, uh, and also working with family foundations. Um, he will be the first one to say there's not a foundation or philanthropic enterprise he hasn't been a part of. Donna Murray Brown is President and CEO of the Michigan Nonprofit Association. Donna has an extensive uh, background in not only being an advocate and champion for the nonprofit sector, but her former career was working in banking and working also on the charitable side of, of banking with the CRAs and other uh, community-based organizations, helping them understand how uh, corporations, banks, and nonprofits can work together. Uh, we also have Tim Delaney, who's the president and CEO of the National Council of Nonprofits. Tim's background includes not only working uh, to develop and launch a state association of nonprofits uh, in Arizona. He's also worked with the Attorney General's Office and has a, an extensive background in, in law, but also working in state government. Um, I'm going to be uh, your moderator today and just talk you through uh, a little bit of the program. But just uh, while we have you here, just want to explain that the Johnson Center is a center on philanthropy that works to understand, strengthen, and advance our sector. And we are delighted to have opportunities like this one to convene thought leaders in the field to talk about the consequences of potential changes in policy. So let's talk about why we should care about tax reform. Now, first off, it's important to note that the, um, the tax code really is aligned to principles within the Constitution, including the 14th Amendment and our right to, in the First Amendment, and right to assemble. Uh, the particular interest that we have with this particular tax reform proposal, unlike the ones in 1969 and those in the 1980s, is that this will not only influence uh, the mechanics of uh, charitable giving and how charitable organizations will function, but actually will go to the very heart of how uh, nonprofits should function and, and remain nonpartisan. And we'll talk a little bit about the Johnson Amendment repeal and some of the other provisions that will affect um, not only tax policy, but the larger sector. Um, we are going to also talk a little bit about um, uh, the fast moving legislation. And we think that's another reason that all of us should care. Uh, we are delighted that we have um, registered over 480 organizations from across the country, so that tells us that um, there is not only keen interest in the general uh, issues that we're talking about, but the very specific issues related to the um, tax policy concerns um, that, that we're seeing move very rapidly. Um, we are also uh, talk a little bit about um, 
the process and um, how the, the committee structures and some of the other vehicles um, that uh, are in place to make decisions around tax reform and talk a little bit about the timeline. So uh, that's a very ambitious agenda for a short period of time. Uh, we're going to um, have our presenters uh, give us their views. We're going to start off with Tim Delaney. Uh, then we'll move to Donna Murray Brown and then finally Rob Collier. After Rob presents, I'll come back on and um, provide some time for Q&A. Um, again, if you have some uh, questions that you would like us to explore, please uh, use our Twitter handle at, at Johnson Center. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn the program over to my dear friend and um, respected colleague at the national level, Tim Delaney. Tim? Great. Thanks, Kyle, and, and thanks to the Johnson Center for hosting this with uh, the other esteemed uh, Michigan organizations. Uh, before I turn to the substance, I, I just want to make sure that uh, the people on the phone lines understand the important role that the Johnson Center plays uh, and uh, how the leadership there is not just in Michigan. Uh, Kyle Caldwell is uh, the former board chair here at the National Council of Nonprofits and is a national player in many other organizations. And so uh, I think we all owe Kyle a debt of gratitude for his national leadership. Um, in my brief time, I, I just want to talk about uh, uh, the uh, issue of uh, why we should care and the conference committee and what's happening. Um, uh, the, the, the most important thing that I want you all to take away from this is that you still have the opportunity to lift your voice and make a difference. Um, yesterday, the, um, uh, the, the majority leaders in the House and the Senate uh, reported out that there was an agreement in principle on the tax cut bill. Again, that's in principle. Uh, they still are uh, typing, they are still negotiating, they are still trying to figure out what they are going to be releasing either later today or most likely uh, late tomorrow um, for the world to see. Um, they are still negotiating, they are still trying to work out the details. So your voice still matters. Uh, so please use your voices uh, and uh, be heard. Um, uh, and we'll get into how you, you can do that later. Uh, the Johnson Amendment is still on the line. Uh, it is still hanging in the balance, whether it's going to go in there or not. And we, of course, do not want it in there. Um, and, and I would just encourage people to focus your ener energy around the Johnson Amendment and what we can do to keep that uh, dangerous and toxic provision out of this bill. The um, uh, I know that the, the nonprofit and, and philanthropic communities were um, working uh, around the clock for many months trying to get a universal deduction for charitable giving uh, in the bill. Uh, why? Because uh, the bill, uh, while nominally it says that the charitable giving incentive will remain the same, because they are cutting uh, other provisions and changing other uh, points on the dial, it, it then uh, is going to lead to a loss for the uh, work of charitable nonprofits of 12 to $20 billion a year annually. Uh, the, uh, the massive change that they're uh, having to the estate tax will um, lose the uh, uh, nonprofit community and philanthropic community $4 billion more. Um, and uh, Th that is a huge consequence uh, on our ability to deliver the services and uh, improve lives across this nation. Um, another big part of this bill is um, not ever discussed, uh, which is um, uh, awful, uh, and that is uh, a very simple formula. Uh, the formula is tax cuts equals revenue cuts equals spending cuts, uh, and uh, importantly, when they're not um, while they will be doing uh, cuts to spending, they will not be cutting human needs. Uh, and in fact, because of all the cuts that will be taking place, that will increase human needs and increase demands on nonprofits at the same time that this tax bill takes money out of our ability to deliver services. Um, what sort of cuts, uh, spending cuts are they gonna, we going to see? Well, because they're uh, going to be throwing us uh, $1.5 trillion deeper into debt um, and uh, 
uh, other things that will uh, automatically require cutting Medicare by $25 billion. Uh, and um, that's just the first year. Uh, there are uh, other um, pr uh, programs that are also on the chopping block and that they're talking about cutting back uh, on um, CHIP, which is the uh, Children's Health Improvement Program, uh, which uh, they have been saying that, that, oh, gee, we can't pay for all that because it'll just throw us deeper into debt. Well, hello, uh, look at your left hand and your right hand. You're inconsistent. Um, they're looking at cutting food stamps and many other domestic programs. And the, the speaker and majority leader have signaled that next year they're going to be focusing on cutting domestic programs. Uh, and so um, it, it's, uh, there is great pain ahead, and, and uh, I applaud the Johnson Center for pulling this call together with the Council of Michigan Foundations and the um, Michigan Nonprofit Association, uh, but I, I don't want people to think that this is just a one-time deal. This is uh, a larger war that we're, we're fighting, and that's to protect the American people, and we, we need to be lifting our voices. Uh, one more thing on, on the, the, the big picture here before I turn to the Johnson Amendment is the states on average receive 31% of all their revenue from uh, the federal government. Can, can you imagine what's going to happen to your state budget uh, if uh, that 31% goes to 30% or 29% or 28%? We're talking billions uh, that will be taken out of the Michigan economy and out of uh, Michigan state government and local governments, and people are going to be turning to nonprofits to uh, help them out uh, and uh, asking philanthropy, private philanthropy to fill the gaps that government is creating. Uh, and um, th th this tax plan, uh, while it's, uh, it's taxes, it's economic, it's budget, it's boring, um, this is real live stuff. Uh, this is meat and potatoes. This is uh, human lives at risk, and we all have a stake in this. Uh, in terms of uh, focusing on what we can actually change yet today uh, and perhaps tomorrow, uh, if we all start calling, uh, let's turn to the Johnson Amendment slide, please. Uh, it, for those of you who um, are, are not aware, the, the Johnson Amendment is uh, named after um, Lyndon Johnson, who was then a, the minority leader in the Senate, who in 1954 offered uh, an amendment uh, on the Senate floor that was accepted by the Senate majority, which were the Republicans, who um, uh, then passed it uh, without any controversy. President Eisenhower signed the bill into law. Uh, and President Reagan signed a law that made it even uh, more protective of the nonprofit community. Um, and for 63 years, uh, the Johnson Amendment has proven successful. Uh, it keeps partisan politics out of our sector. Charitable nonprofits, houses of worship, and foundations may not engage in uh, partisan politicking. Um, what that means is we cannot spend any of our resources. We cannot endorse candidates. We cannot oppose candidates. We have to stay away from it. Uh, many people may say, well, gee, uh, we're being limited. Actually, we're being protected. Can you imagine what's going to happen if you're a nonprofit and a funder comes into you and dangles $40,000, $75,000, saying, I would really like to give this to you, but I'm really trying to make sure that uh, people support my candidate that I'm backing in this race. Will you uh, assist me in that? And if you're hungry, you might feel like you've got to say yes. But what happens when you take that money and uh, another longtime donor says, gee, I can't believe that you endorse someone. I will never give you a penny again. We're going to be caught in a vicious cycle. Or uh, the chair of, of the uh, budget committee at the, or the appropriations committee at the state or uh, a um, state um, uh, executive or uh, a local government official says, well, you know, I would award this government grant or contract to you, but, you know, I, it really can only go to one party or the other. Are, are you with us or against us? Uh, and it, it will be traumatic for us. Um, can you imagine going into your um, – uh, the, the – um, 
the uh, going into your houses of worship and having someone come in uh, and say you should be voting for uh, having the, the, your preacher say we should be uh, going to, uh, endorsing this candidate or opposing that candidate. Um, or if you are a foundation, can you imagine having someone come into your boardroom as a board member and say, we need to have our foundation endorse this person, and then another board member says, no, we need to endorse that person. Uh, and so we really need to make sure that we are keeping partisanship out of our sector. Uh, we've got to stay away from uh, what's, um, what is being threatened. Um, and uh, there is a proposal in the House bill that got through at Section 5201 that would substantially weaken this protection. It would create a huge loophole uh, for money to be uh, coming to uh, uh, political contributions coming to uh, 501c3 organizations. Um, and the Joint Committee on Taxation has said uh, in its testimony that uh, it would divert um, over uh, $2 billion away from uh, campaign contributions um, to uh, away from uh, traditional uh, political parties and uh, political campaign committees, uh, and instead uh, it would then be run through uh, contributions to uh, nonprofits and houses of worship. Uh, suddenly, that means that they would be tax deductible. They would have an incentive to reroute their money away from traditional political groups uh, and then make it to uh, nonprofits uh, and houses of worship. Um, that money will then be anonymous in terms of who the donors are. So if you um, don't like dark money, you're going to really not like this bill because this is going to make Citizens United pale by comparison. Uh, and it will politicize our community, and we do not want that. Who's the we? Uh, more than 5,600 charitable nonprofits and foundations signed a community letter in favor of nonpartisanship. We have um, also seen that more than 100 uh, religious denominations and organizations across the country have signed up opposing this. Not a single one, uh, not a single denomination has stepped forward to say they want it. All are opposed to it. We have the uh, National Association of State uh, Charity Officials, the regulators of nonprofits who know us best, who say, Congress, stay out of this. It's only the third time they've ever taken a position on a federal matter, and they are saying, keep politics out of nonprofits. Um, and, uh, and I can go on and on with statistics of who all wants uh, this to, to die and not move forward. Uh, there is universal opposition, and we need to lift our voices to say no. Um, we don't want to have uh, any uh, money coming in uh, through the ordinary course of our business, um, because while it says a de minimis amount, um, the Joint Committee on Taxation says that's going to be $2.1 billion, uh, which uh, after you look at people's tax deductions, uh, uh, tax rates of 25 to 35 percent, that means six to eight billions of dollars uh, sloshing around through the nonprofit, um, the religious, and uh, philanthropic organizations uh, to influence elections. That's not our role. That's not our mission. We need to focus on our mission. Uh, and uh, let me turn the uh, mic now over to uh, the next person, Kyle. Thanks, Tim, and um, thanks. We also got some questions that we'll follow up. So, if, Tim, if you can stay around, we'd love for you to be part of the Q&A section. I know your time is uh, valuable, but we'd really love for you to stick around with for, for that section of the call. Great, thanks. Thank you. And as you all can tell, um, this is why it's great to have uh, not only a conversation about Michigan philanthropy, but also to bring in great wisdom from the national level. We're going to now turn to Donna Murray Brown, who's really going to talk to, the, to us uh, what this means for nonprofits. Donna? Yeah. Thank you so much, Kyle, and thank you so much for the, uh, being able to host this, um, this conference and webinars. It's really, really important. So thank you for that. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for spending your lunchtime with us. I'd like to start with the Federal Tax Reform Bill, H.R. 1, and just sharing with everyone that it really has great implications for nonprofits. 
across the country, certainly, and in the state of Michigan, um, for sure, and communities all across um, the country as well. Federal funds make up, uh, in Michigan, 40% of Michigan's state budget. Those funds, which will likely be reduced to the proposed tax legislation that was just outlined by Tim, that support many of the programs that are delivered by nonprofits across communities um, that we serve. There are many programs that would be impacted by the reduction of funds or the elimination of the programs that were outlined by Tim, like CHIP and, and SNAP as well, and also investments that uh, support our communities in, um, in the states like infrastructure projects, highway planning, and construction. After this presentation, I am aware that we will be sending a follow-up email um, to everyone, but I wanted to share with you that part of that follow-up will include the 16 largest programs that will be adversely uh, or potentially impacted by a reduction of funds from the federal level. A point that I really want to make here in Michigan that I think is particularly important is that 2018 um, is going to be a very big year. It's going to be a big election year in Michigan, and almost all the elected officials will be running for election or re-election. The landscape may be very different, but we are hearing that there's going to be a very lean budget year. It's very unlikely because of that that candidates will be really trying to push tax increases. Instead, we believe that they will be emphasizing on reducing spending. So we shouldn't expect any increase in revenue from the state to make up the shortfall from the federal government. As we know, reduction in revenue and tight budgets typically play out with reduced support of programs often carried out by the charitable sector, i.e. nonprofits. So when revenue is lean for the state, revenue is typically lean for local governments. As local governments struggle to raise revenue to provide services for their citizens, we expect continued aggressive challenges to the state's exempt status of nonprofits. And this is particularly important, and we've been following this for, for several years now. Over the last three years, we started tracking cases of nonprofits that were involved in court cases fighting these challenges to pay property taxes. In the first year of tracking, there were 42 cases, with cases increasing to a total of over 70 cases just last year. Because of the uh, cuts and, and the lean budget, we expect that this will only get worse here in Michigan. Now, those of you in Michigan can remember that we lost the charitable tax credit in 2011. I think this is a cautionary tale for others across the country that still maintain charitable incentives. Research had been done by the Johnson Center for Philanthropy and revealed the impact of giving after losing the credit. What we found over, since the tracking had been done by the Johnson Center that over a million dollars in charitable um, gifts have been lost. We found that individuals still gave, but yet they gave at lower amounts. This was particularly true for community foundations that held endowed funds. So when you think about the, the notion of doubling the standard deduction that's part of the federal tax um, proposal plan, uh, it's, although it's very popular, we think it has a negative unintended consequences for charities in particular. So if you can imagine right now, about 30% of people itemize, and that number will go down to 5% with the doubling of the standard deduction that's being proposed. The Joint Committee on Taxation estimates that doubling the standard deduction will result in more than 95 billion fewer dollars deducted. So how much will that um, will go to nonprofits? It's, it's hard to say. We do know that, but Indiana State University did a study that estimates the decrease in charitable giving to be about $13 billion. I've also seen other estimates that have roughly been between the ranges of $12 and $20 billion. So this is a huge uh, impact here if we look at the standard deduction being doubled. For Michigan, though, losing the tax credits coupled with the proposed tax legislation can potentially produce a devastating impact to charitable giving in Michigan. So this is really, really huge for us. There is, though, I want to share with you a glimmer of hope, at least for a, a part of the sector here in Michigan. There is some proposed current legislation to restore the lost credits benefiting community foundations, food banks, homeless shelters, it's, uh, Senate Bill 405. I do want to let the group that Michigan Nonprofit Association and the Council of Michigan Foundation testified in support of the legislation in the Senate Finance Committee. And now we're just waiting for it to be voted on in the Senate. So there is some, uh, some progress that's moving uh, to restore those credits. 
Well, finally, I just want to um, say to this group, now more than ever, and I think Tim did a really good job by sharing this with you, but now more than ever, we must be deliberate and strategic in our advocacy efforts. It's an imperative for the charitable sector across the country, especially in Michigan, to be able to advocate for its mission and to be involved in advocacy, and yes, dare I say lobbying. This should not be considered as an option anymore. I know there's been lots of confusion as to whether a nonprofit can lobby um, for themselves. And in this case, we really, really want to emphasize that, that it is an imperative and it's not an option anymore. With that, I'd like to turn it back over to Kyle and let us hear from the esteemed Rob Collier. <laughs> Thanks, Donna. And um, we'll uh, give folks um, uh, who, are, who are presenting some time to share with those who are um, uh, participating on the webinar uh, with some action steps, follow-up items, and ways that they can um, share their voices. So now we're going to talk about what this means for foundations and funders and donors. And for that, we could think of no one better than Rob Collier at the Council of Michigan Foundations. Rob? Uh, thanks, Kyle. Um, let me just say, again, my thanks to everyone on the call and obviously to Kyle, Tim, and Donna. And Donna teed up kind of the first point I want to make. And I've been asked by uh, private foundations, can I advocate on this bill and on these issues? And clearly, you can advocate. This is a self-defense issue for private philanthropy. And so if you ever have anyone says that you can, tell them to call me because you can advocate on this issue. So you've heard about the charitable tax deduction, and, and Tim mentioned the estate tax. And I just want to comment on the estate tax that um, we're trying to be supportive of the Senate version of the bill. We don't know if that is in the final negotiated settlement they're now talking about, but um, the, 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 federal ver the, the Senate version will not eliminate the estate tax. It will still keep it. So while it will raise the, the cap, um, we won't lose what the projected four, total $4 billion if the House version passes. So we want it's another reason why philanthropy needs to be engaged in this, because loss of the federal estate tax um, does impact creation of new foundations in a big way. Um, Donna has already mentioned um, you know, the loss of the charitable credits in Michigan and our experience there. And I might just add that that did confirm that tax policy does impact giving. It doesn't impact one's desire to give, but it does impact how much people are going to give. And we saw folks say, hey, there's no longer a partnership with the government, so we're going to reduce our charitable giving. Instead of giving $400, we'll give $200. So we saw a dramatic drop there. I think the third item I just want to touch on, and, and Tim, thanks for giving us the update on the Johnson Amendment. And in the slide that um, we had when Tim was talking, there were two key phrases in that section that is being considered in the House version. One is ordinary course of business. And I can tell you that I've already had people, um, lawyers and tax policy experts calling me and saying, okay, does the IRS have a definition of the ordinary course of business? And the other um, key phrase in that section that, that we saw in the slide was um, people are asking, well, what does de minimis really mean? And part of the, 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 the real challenge that we have to understand is that if they do go forward with repealing the Johnson Amendment, the IRS really doesn't have the capacity to figure this out, and we're all going to be le left with some major undertaking to educate not only um, givers, but also educate the boards of our grantees, the boards of our foundations on how to handle this, um, this amendment should it go forward, which is another reason why we've got to keep our voices active. So as we look at you know, what this means for foundations, I just want to comment on clearly individual giving is the largest pie of our charitable dollar in America, and this is going to impact individual givers. And so we're going to have to, as foundations, consider how do we help our grantees, how do we help our nonprofits retell their stories so they can really be impactful. Um, and, and as we know, there's a real quest for data. There's, um, you know, it's going to, I think it's going to change the way a number of our grantees relate to their individual givers. I think the second issue is, is it's going to also require us to really ramp up our efforts 
support to support governance of nonprofits because there's going to be some real added pressures on non on nonprofit governance um, should this whole um, bill go forward as as we currently see it. The last two points I just want to mention for foundations, both private foundations and public charities, community foundations, etc., is that the bill in, has some very interesting um, provisions in it that will, will essentially add new taxes um, and added reporting requirements, not just for foundations but for the whole nonprofit sector. Clearly one of those that we need to be concerned about is the excess compensation tax that's been proposed for all nonprofits because it really does impact you know, someone said to me, well, Rob, that just means they're going after those high-paid football coaches. Well, no, it's much more than that. I mean, when you think about the need that we have in our field, um, in our nonprofit sector for talent, um, we're talking about heart surgeons, we're talking about um, investment managers, we're talking about a lot of folks that we need in our sector, and this new excess compensation tax is not going to make it easy, to put it mildly. The other thing I would just say is I've had a number of calls from folks saying, I see a lot of reference to this phrase called UBIT. Um, what does UBIT really mean? And so I think for us in philanthropy and for our nonprofit colleagues, we're going to have to do a fair amount of education on unrelated business income tax and how we can best manage that because some of the new taxes that are being proposed will impact our efforts to have a diversified sector with sources of revenue coming from a multitude, you know, from several sources. So I think UBIT's going to be another area in which foundations can help our grantees, can help ourselves understand what some of the small fine print means in this bill. I would just end by saying, as you know, Tim started off, as you've heard from all of us, your voice does matter. We saw the slide um, with the members of the conference committee. We have three of them from Michigan, Congressman Upton, Congressman Levin, and Senator Stavenow. We've been in touch with all three, and if those of you in other states who are on the call um, um, have relationships with a member of this conference committee, it is not too late to reach out to them. And, you know, I have found it's, you know, the, the people that often are the fastest people we get to them are their schedulers. Um, but it's not too late to reach out to them because the other key issue I found that does have bipartisan interest is the fact that our sector employs an incredible number of Americans, an incredible number of people in not only Michigan but across our, our great country. And one economist at George Washington, um, who I asked to look at the numbers, projected that this could cost a loss of anywhere from 220,000 to 260,000 jobs in our sector across the country, which is, which is a lot of jobs, and that gets the attention of members of Congress on both sides of the aisle. So I'll stop there because we want to respond to folks' questions. Thank you again. Kyle, back to you. Thanks, Rob. And uh, I just want to go over a few of the highlights of what we uh, just heard from, from our presenters. So um, one, one of the things that we wanted to do was also just make sure everyone clearly understood the point that, that uh, Rob, Donna, and Tim were making about uh, the Johnson Amendment. This is, um, of course, included in the tax reform bill, although it's, it's less related to tax policy and more related to Nonpartisan, uh, nonpartisan activities of nonprofits. You'll note that in the slide we've, um, we've listed that uh, how this will impact um, various sectors. We've uh, been clear on what section it is in the uh, House Tax Bill and where you can find it. And then at the end of our um, time together, we'll share with you uh, links to places where you can uh, either get more information about the impact of the Johnson Amendment's repeal or um, give you uh, uh, a link to the sign-on letter that um, was led by the National Council of Nonprofits and others to get uh, nonprofits' voice out there in front of lawmakers to help them understand um, the implications. I think uh, before I leave the Johnson Amendment issue, I just want to point out um, again, as, as Rob was mentioning, that with regard to the Johnson Amendment, because it is specifically targeted at nonprofits that includes um, donors as well as charities, 
uh, organizations can be very vocal and public about their concerns related to the Johnson Amendment repeal. Um, so you'll see in the sign-on letter and you'll see in some of the places where uh, logos are uh, shared of those who have uh, expressed their concerns about this, that there is a mix of uh, funders as well as nonprofit organizations. So it's a pretty wide array of organizations that are concerned about this. Uh, one other thing that um, I'll sh just share content-wise before we get to the, the questions is the, sort of the next steps. And for this, I'm, I'm going to give just a quick overview, but I'll ask Rob, Donna, and, and Tim to, to fill in the gaps. As we mentioned earlier, um, and we'll show the slide again on the, on the conference committee members, that there is a committee of House and Senate members who are charged with reconciling the differences between the two bills um, and then helping craft and master a, a single uh, identical set of bills from the House and Senate that could be reconciled and, and go forth to the president uh, in one bill for his signature. Um, one of the things that are uh, sort of a glitch in this process is that even though there is a conference committee, as Tim mentioned, there are uh, key members uh, in the House and Senate who are actually uh, negotiating the terms under which the conference committee will operate. So unlike other times when you would have the two bills and the conferees would uh, work on that and um, come back to the two bodies uh, with their, uh, their legislation, there is an added step where there are negotiations taking place um, that will then be um, uh, forwarded to the conference committee and then hopefully um, out of that comes um, a more refined uh, bill. So th the question that um, that many will have is, well, as Tim and um, and Rob and Donna pointed out, well, what should I do? Uh, I think what I've heard from all three, and, and either one of you please chime in, is that there is no wrong door right now to um, have nonprofits and funders voice their concerns and, and offer data and impact um, on the, the potential of this issue because it will go to the full floor, even though you might not have a conferee, that, that there are other opportunities for them to engage. So Rob, Donna, Tim, is there anything uh, as far as the next steps in the process that we would want the folks on this webinar to know before we go to Q&A? If not, we'll go to the question. Uh, Kyle, uh, Kyle yeah, I, I'm sorry. Uh, yep. uh, I, I, I just want everyone on the phone call, uh, wherever you are in Michigan or anywhere else, to write down this number, 202-225-3121. That's the capital switchboard. Again, 202-225-3121. You can call that number, and uh, there's a... Uh, a system that's set up, you put in your zip code, and then th they will uh, send you either to your senator or your representative. Uh, even if they are not on that list of conferees, uh, please call them. What we need to be doing is, is uh, creating a buzz up on the hill that this is unacceptable, uh, that, the, uh, that you're a constituent and you're calling in opposition to this very harmful pr provision uh, in the tax code concerning um, the Johnson Amendment, Section 5201 of the House Bill. Just tell them that you strongly oppose it. Uh, we need, and uh, the, 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 the second step is to uh, ask them to talk to the uh, tax bill conferees, to tell them do not include this. They're trying to take out the things that are most controversial. We need to make this extremely controversial because it is. Uh, and uh, again, call that number, say your constituent, that you're calling an opposition to it. Please tell the, the conferees to keep Section 5201 out. Great, thanks. Donna, Rob, anything from, from your standpoint? Uh, yeah, I, this is Rob. Um, Kyle, this is Rob. I, I'll just add that, um, you know, as, as Tim highlighted earlier, um, we've got a short-term problem with this bill, but if this bill passes, we've got a long-term problem, um, and that is, you know, the whole issue of what is the role of government. And this, this, this notion that we can add a trillion five to the federal debt 
and and not worry about it. Um, I, I mean, what we all know, as as you know, Tim and you mentioned, is that there is great interest in further reducing domestic spending. And what we've also got to let people know, because I hear have members of Congress who will say, "Well, philanthropy can do this, and nonprofits can do this," and it's like. Yeah, no, we cannot replace government. We can be a strategic partner, but we've got to make sure that members know. And in, in our state, in Michigan, we've been dealing with this, you know, for the last decade where we've had members of our state legislature try to offload programs as a state responsibility to philanthropy and the nonprofit sector. So I think we have to reiterate that message as part of our discussions with conference committee members and any member of Congress. Thanks. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Kyle. Um, just that I, I want to don't want to lose sight of what Tim and Rob said about what we can do right now. Like, like that's where I hope that our focus would would stay at this moment. But then I also like to share with you that understanding that if this and when this passes, whatever bill it, it looks like, what it shakes to be, is that there's going to be a response. <clears throat> excuse me, from the state in terms of what the state will have to do to respond to the changes. Um, at the federal level. And so it's going to be in, in really imperative that nonprofits begin thinking about how, the, they, how they actually bring data and information to legislators in their states around the importance of nonprofits and the adverse impact of the, of the bill. And, and that's going to be really, really important to not wait until it happens, but just really begin thinking about strategically how uh, the state will, their states will be responding and what nonprofits need to do to galvanize themselves and their messaging around the impact. Great, thanks. Now, we have a, a, a series of questions here that, um, and we have very little time, so I'm going to um, throw the questions out. I'll, I'll actually direct them to one of our presenters, and then if you can give us quick answers, and then if there's uh, more in-depth follow-up, we'll put it on the, the, the website uh, for other resources for people to follow up on. So one question, Rob, uh, we, have a, we have related to uh, those interested in um, how this funding might uh, impact uh, nonprofits, but really um, uh, funders and funding organizations. Um, so one is, uh, do you uh, understand, um, what do you understand about how this might impact IRA charitable rollovers or um, some of the excise taxes related to foundations? Can you give us a sense of where you see, um, you know, the, the potential impact there? Uh, sure. Uh, the good news is that um, the bill, both versions of the bill, do not um, address the issue of of the IRA charitable rollover. So we will still have the IRA charitable rollover as a giving tool to use. Um, and we know that a lot of Michiganders and a lot of uh, folks, when they hit that age at 70 and a half, are in fact using the IRA charitable rollover because. And, and this is a great month to be talking about this because the market has been doing very well and people have to take a required distribution and they can roll funds to their favorite charitable um, um, organization or their favorite community foundation as well. Um, they just can't roll it into a donor advised fund or to a private foundation. So the IRA charitable rollover stays in place. I think the other issue um, that was in the House version but is not in the Senate version is new requirements on donor advised funds. And we're hopeful that based on the conversations that I've been having that, um, that that will not be brought up. But what we can expect is that if it doesn't get brought up in the final discussions on this bill next week, um, we will most likely see a new effort. Um, and we already have seen the IRS release new, uh, uh, an, an invitation for comments on new reporting requirements for donor advised funds. So, so donor advised funds are still on people's radar screen, but hopefully not in this bill. I'll stop there. Thanks. Donna, could you talk a little bit about um, some of the, um, the other provisions that, that aren't in, uh, that, that are in this that aren't related necessarily to, specifically to nonprofits? So, for example, you or Tim, could you talk a little bit about what doubling the standard deduction would mean for charitable giving? Why, why do we care about uh, the standard deduction moving up? Sure. So, the standard deduction um, right now, there's uh, roughly 30% of 
individuals that actually take advantage of that. And as one would understand, if you're um, itemizing on your taxes and you're giving um, funding to, um, to a charity of your choice, that that is the typical way that um, you would deduct that, um, that gift that you gave to that charity on your taxes. And so that becomes, in a sense, an incentive for people to actually give um, to a, a charity based on receiving a deduction. And of course, in the state of Michigan, there was an incentive to do that. And we saw the fallout of it being uh, that people still gave, but they gave less. So if, the, if there's a standard deduction that's being doubled, meaning that it's going to go up so high that it doesn't matter, um, if you actually give to a charity, that that wouldn't necessarily be the case for itemization anymore because you're getting getting such um, a higher um, ability to deduct. Then the chances are that it's going to adversely impact your gift uh, to a charity because you've got this elevated um, deduction made available to you. So that that's the consequences. And that is that if that is in a sense of is not there anymore as it would have been if you were itemizing and reducing the ability for someone to itemize from 30% of the population down to 5% really leaves out a, a huge amount of individuals who would normally itemize and um, to, uh, to a lesser degree only 5% that would uh, take advantage of that. So the idea is what's the incentive now to give to a nonprofit? And if you were to give that, we already know here based on what happened in Michigan is that People might still give, but they might give at a lower amount, and that could be still devastating for a nonprofit who has um, um, received certain certain amount of funding and now is receiving less um, funding as they think about advancing their mission. Thanks. We've had a couple questions about where where the source for the some of the data is. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we'll so, we'll make sure that we post that, um, including the report that you talked about, Donna. There's also um, information that's come out from uh, Indiana University, the Lilly School, that talks about projections um, on the decline in charitable giving, anywhere from 5% on up. We'll make sure that we, um, we post that resource as well. Tim, I have a question for you, if you could, and we're, we're running short on time, so it's got to be a brief answer. I'm really sorry. Um, the, the Johnson Amendment repeal, could you quickly give us um, some sense of where the push is coming for this, who's championing the, the repeal, and is there a way that the folks on the, on the call should be thinking about how to, how to uh, share information with those who are uh, proponents of this repeal? Well, first, uh, both to the, uh, some of the data points as well as um, uh, for further information on the Johnson Amendment, uh, there is a wealth of information that's been posted on the uh, website of www.givevoice.org. That's givevoice.org. Uh, and there you can see the uh, community letter uh, against or for um, uh, nonprofit nonpartisanship that uh, foundations, nonprofits, and houses of worship have all signed. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, those who are behind this, uh, this has actually been a great fundraising tool for some organizations that are uh, very conservative uh, who uh, have taken up the cause saying that, that they want to allow um, uh, preachers to be able to preach from the pulpit. Uh, and it, again, I, I don't want to sound partisan, uh, but it, it has been from very conservative uh, in a narrow band uh, in that every denomination has come out against it. And those who are pushing it most fiercely are really not religious organizations uh, in, um, in the true sense. Uh, and so we're very concerned that uh, a very few voices have been able to get behind this, uh, such as the National Religious Broadcasters Group, uh, that uh, their members could very much benefit if uh, donors who uh, are campaign uh, contributors who in the past have given to political parties can now get a tax deduction if they give it to uh, a televangelist, for example, to be broadcasting uh, who they oppose or who they support, uh, then the, the, the political contributor gets um, the tax write-off, so they incentivize giving, and the um, 
and the televangelist church continues to then grow and, and uh, with its influence, which uh, that you could say that's part of the process, but so is the rest of us speaking out and saying no, um, and, and I think we need to do that. Thanks, Tim. We have a, another question that um, Rob, Donna, maybe that you all can talk about being um, close to the ground on some of this work. Um, with, um, could you just kind of go over where you see the, the risks are for um, uh, the next steps? You know, we talked a little bit about funding cuts and what that might do to prevention funding, where th th that impacted. What's the funding risk to, to youth, to seniors, to, to other uh, social programs? How, help us understand uh, what, the, what the consequences more broadly are. Donna, you go ahead on this one. I'll follow you. Sure. Um, thank you for the question. I think you know my initial reaction to that is that there may be some risk to um, to some organizations as it relates to programs that they have that they may not be able to continue. Um, I think that's the, that's the greatest um, risk. I know there's um, some that say that there may be fallout where nonprofits aren't able to even keep their doors open. I, I don't necessarily subscribe to, to that belief. I do think that there is um, there are going to be risks to some programs and the amount of people uh, and um, services that can be um, provided and people served. So I think that's that's the biggest risk um, in um, in communities as I see it. Um, also, I think that as a byproduct of that, um, there are going to be um, more um, collaborations. That'll be kind of a, a bit of a um, remedy that nonprofits will find themselves actually. Um, participating in to be able to mitigate some of the resources not being made uh, available to them. So we're, you know, essentially we're watching uh, this and listening to our members and partners about what the impact is going to be. And so I think we don't recognize completely what the, all the risks will be and we'll learn that um, as we go. But, um, you know, right now it's about um, just monitoring and, um, and being proactive and trying to preserve what we do have. And, and that's why, again, it's really important for us to act now and, and making certain that we keep the, the operational environment, um, like the Johnson Amendment, um, intact um, and, and not repeal for what we think is going to be a, a huge fallout. Thank you. Rob, I have a specific question for, for you. Um, some, as they uh, reach out to members of Congress, you often get the question, and I know you're an experienced uh, visitor to the Hill and, and you're part of the Foundations on the Hill movement, and you you choreograph these conversations. Oftentimes, policymakers will say, "Okay, well, I know what you're against, but but what do you want me to do? What 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 are you for?" And one of the things that has been sort of um, bandied about is a um, changing the charitable deduction to be above the line. Can you kind of explain, uh, you know, that proposal and and what it would might mean, even though it's not part of the tax bill? Um, yeah, yes, Rob here. We, we'll send out a link so everyone will have an ability to go and dig deeper onto the universal charitable deduction. And I would just say, you know, Tim Delaney and, and, and his team have been leaders in this national charitable giving coalition. Um, that there is bipartisan interest. There was legislation introduced um, both in the House and the Senate, um, but we were unsuccessful in getting included in this bill. Um, and so I would just say that you can see that that will be revisited um, and as part of our annual um, pilgrimage to the Hill in March, we'll definitely be talking about that. Um, Tim, do you want to just add, there is, there is a link that explains in greater detail the value of universal charitable deduction, right? Yes. Uh, and um, it, on our website, uh, we have a, uh, actually a comparison chart of uh, the House and the Senate bills uh, that uh, then allows people to, to get into it. Um, and our website is uh, councilofnonprofits.org, councilofnonprofits.org. And, and people can then go to that comparison chart, uh, which we will be updating as soon as the actual bill comes out um, so that uh, the, the field can see quickly what's at risk. Great, thanks. And then, um, Donna, did um, did you want to share a little bit more about human service agencies and um, some of the risks there? Yeah, thank you, uh, Kyle. Sure. Um, 
So I'm just thinking more about the, the question too. I wanted to add on around the question around the risk and, and who might it be towards. And so human service agencies, based on the cuts that we see, are, are um, they make up at least here in the state, here and across the country, around 30% of nonprofit organizations and on delivering services to communities. So the risk based on the uh, federal tax uh, legislation that's being proposed really gets to um, services that that particular part, portion of the sector actually um, provides to communities. So I think that is going to be one that we will continue to watch and monitor, and it's suspect that that's where we'll see a lot of the, um, the risk occur. Thank you. Um, we um, are nearing the end of our call, and we know that there's a lot of questions we didn't get to answer. We apologize. The hour went very quickly, and we tried to fit in as much as we could. Um, there will be a link on the Johnson Center website, johnsoncenter.org forward slash tax policy, that we will add these links that we've talked about as well as other resources. We'll keep adding to that as uh, more information becomes available. So uh, you'll receive an email and follow-up to this webinar with that link, but also um, you can use that uh, address as you see it here uh, to follow up right away. Um, so expect an email from us. Uh, we would also like to just take a quick second and say thank you not only to the uh, National Council of Nonprofits, Tim Delaney, uh, the Council of Michigan Foundations, Rob Collier, the Michigan Nonprofit Association, and Donna Murray Brown, but also the Grand Rapids Community Foundation for uh, being a special sponsor uh, for this event. We're very grateful to have uh, great support here locally, but also to have uh, an organization uh, like the Community Foundation thinking about the broader national context and how that impacts communities. We've run out of time. Um, we will um, make uh, all these resources available. If you'd like to connect with the Johnson Center, you have our um, Facebook, Twitter handle, and all of our other contact information listed on the webinar. Again, I want to thank Rob, Donna, Tim, and everybody uh, um, uh, pr who presented. Uh, I want to thank our team here at the Johnson Center for putting this webinar together, but most especially I want to thank um, over the 480 registrants who uh, made this webinar possible. We want to thank you, and we'll hopefully um, see the fruits of our labor in, uh, immediately and well into the new year. Thank you all, and we really appreciate your participation.